is lecture 10 of ECE 2305. And so today, what we're going to be talking about is cellular technology and networks and Bluetooth. We'll talk about Bluetooth because we all kind of use it. All right. So, like this has always been a question of mine. What, what's the deal with generations, right? There was a Star Trek film called Generations. But what, what does it mean with cellular technology? And so what we're going to talk about is we're going to say, what is 1G? What is 2G? What is 3G? What is this 4G? And when, you know, my personal opinion, and I might get hell from it from my wireless friends out there, what happens is I would like to say that LTE is not 4G. Don't, don't, like, what LTE is, is 3.9G. It's almost 4G. That's what LTEA is, right? But I'll explain what this is all about. Your book does a so-so job of it. Yes? LTE isn't 4G because it's not 1,000 megabytes per second or something? Even better. It doesn't have the artificial intelligence that everyone thinks 4G should have. There should be an AI, an artificial intelligence, in the base station that makes all the decision making without the need for any humans in the loop. LTE doesn't do that sort of thing. It's all like if, then, else, if, then, else. L, uh, that's what LTA is trying to do, but no one's come up with that artificial intelligence. That's why I would like to say LTE is 3.9G, but everyone rounds up. Excellent question. Excellent question. Okay. First generation. No one should have a first generation phone anymore. It should be the size of a brick. Um, this was the first of cellular networks. And what happens is it was an analog technique. So your voice data was analog modulation, it was FM, and it was deployed in the 1980s. So you could look in your like, you know, parents' attic, maybe you'll find a 1G phone. It was probably pretty big. Oh, there's probably a battery that's pretty large. You have this little crank in order to power the battery. No, 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 no. there's no crank. And so and the, most, uh, the standard that did 1G, that described 1G, was something called the Advanced Mobile Phone Service, or AMPS. So for electrical engineers, we all love amps, right? Woo! Okay. So it's also popular in a few other places in the world. And so amps, what's really cool about it, it used two 25 megahertz bands. Um, it carried voice, but embedded in the voice, you had 100 millisecond bursts of data that's encoded in FSK. And this data is control data. It basically says, OK, uh, time to set up the channel for this user or that user. So what happens is inside my speech, which is analog data, I would say, OK, I'm going to insert 100 milliseconds of actual control data. And the control data is something like for, um, in this case, um, could be for, for any number of reasons, like, you know, like um, say, hey, I'm still the same user or whatnot. And in particular, inside an AMPS capable phone, there's something called a numeric assignment module or NAM. And this, what's the most important thing? Why is this identity so important? Because the phone company needs to know how to charge you, right? Like, you know, like, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, I always get flack from, by my colleagues in the department because what happens is I come late and I said, my phone says it's, it's 12 o'clock. This is when the meeting starts, right? And then everybody pulls out their cell phone and says, but Verizon disagrees with you. It's actually 12.02 or something like that. So I'm two minutes late. And don't even get me started with like my wife and other folks and stuff. And they're right. Because what happens is when it comes to billing, so some companies bill by the, uh, by the minute, right? For the most part, and then they round up. So it's like, oh, you talked 12 minutes and one second, round up to 13, right? In those days when you didn't have unlimited voice, that's what happened. There was one company in Canada called Fido. They billed to the second. Right? So that was awesome. Like, you know, so none of this rounding up business. But what happens is it's all about who should pay the bill. Right? So amps, they just want to know. They wanted your identity because they wanted to bill you. And they don't start billing until you got through. So ring, ring, ring. They don't bill you. And then, hello? Start billing. OK, one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute. And then when you hang up, OK, round to the, to the next minute, boom. That's how much you're charged. 2G. OK, so we're moving through the generations. So 2G 90, in the 90s, um, and the most popular thing is GSM. 
We used to have it on the older cell phones, like think about five, ten years ago. What happens if you didn't get good coverage? You see this thing that says GSM on your phone or 2G, right? So what happens is if you didn't get 3G service, you got the next guy down. And so this was the point in the 1990s. I don't think we have much of a 2G network. Everyone's now going to 3 and 4G. Like 3G is now the standard. 4G is being rolled out. So GSM, you have things like SMS. That's your text message, right? You have something called GPRS. And so that guy provides you, this is the, this is the guy that provided the foundation for 4G, packet-based cellular networks. Yes? That's a good question. I should, so the, do pagers use GSM services? I need to look into that. But my, my suspicion is pagers have their own frequency band. Because I, ah, you also gave a great idea for people to find the frequency band. I think pagers are within the frequency band of your RTL SDR. And who uses pagers a lot? <laughs> and how many doctors are in Worcester? Moy doctors, lots of doctors. So, if, so find your frequency, find the paging bands, set your RTL SDR. So you're going to see tons of like, oh, Dr. So and so, you know. So, yeah, pagers. So, uh, GSM IP based. Yes? Uh, was the 114 kilobits? You know, I really don't know. There must be a, I, I need to do some research on that about like why they chose 160 characters. It's almost like why, why did Twitter do this length of a message as well? Like what's the rationale behind? There must be either, like I don't think it was a marketing scheme. There must be a technical reason for it. I'll look into it. That's a good question. All right. So in fact, this GPRS because of the IP based telephony, we actually call it 2.5G because GSM by itself, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. It does some things digitally, some things analog. But having things IP-based sounds a lot more advanced than just basic G, uh, GSM. So usually people classify it as 2.5G. Okay. And what, what's interesting is what GSM, how it handles data. There's something called the physical channel. So this is all the same data, but it's being looked at differently. When someone says physical channel, that's literally the information physically in the time slot, right? So this is not a CDMA phone. This is TDMA. GSM is TDMA. What happens is there's something called a logical channel. How that, what is that data used once you received it across the physical channel? So you now take that da data and you say, OK, what's the logical channel? And so you have traffic channel. That's your useful data. And you have control channel. That is your the information for controlling the cell phone's connectivity to the network. Okay? And then, of course, we all know this. We still have it. SIM cards, right? So smart card, it's encrypted, has your ID. It's pretty safe, right? Not, hopefully not hackable. And what happens is this describes the user, right? We use, SIM, we use smart cards in a lot of things. I think credit cards coming out in... End of this year, beginning of next, are also going to have a chip in them, smart chip. And so, because right now, the only thing protecting your ID, uh, identity on your credit card and your debit card is that stupid, not encrypted little magnetic stripe that, oh, uh, can I take your credit card? Oh, here you go. <laughs> oh, you must be Alex Wiglinski. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, what happens is you have a smart card, it contains your international mobile. Um, subscriber identity or IMSI, okay? And uh, what happens is you can use it for a lot of other things, but GSM uses it again for things like, um, you know, like authentication because they still need to know when they bill you, they know it's actually you, right? So, and then other things like Wi-Fi networks. Okay, we're moving up to 3G. 3G came at pretty much a very bad time in the wireless world. So what happens is, and I was there, I was a grad student. What happens is in 2000, 2001, the tech bubble went poof. So up until 2000, all my friends said I was an idiot for going to grad school. They were like, 
oh, I got stock options. I'm at this company. I, I can get, like, they were driving around their BMWs. And I said, no, 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 I want to do grad studies. I want to get a PhD and stuff. And then the layoffs began in 2000, 2001, like 10,000 at a time, people being laid off and stuff. And where do people go when they can't find another job and they get laid off? They go to grad school. So what happens is, here I am, I started, I'm in my first year of PhD, and then it's like, hey, I thought you got that great job at Nortel and stuff. Oh, well, yeah, I, I, my, my division got laid off, you know? So, so what happens is, um, bad time, because what happened is 3G was coming out, they over-provisioned it. If you look for the documentation that describes the 3G standard, it's like, oh my god, like, I don't understand everything. It's, it's, it, let's just say it was very extensive. They over-engineered it. It then became, at some point, economical to deploy in the field, but it took a while because there, it came at a wrong time. People were not investing in tech companies because of that bubble bursting. Um, they put in too many features. You also had, and I'm going to go ahead, you have three different technologies all rolled into it. So I talked about CDMA, right? So first of all, you know, here's some of the basic features. So it supports IP-based, like, you know, so you have voice quality that's the same as your telephone landline. You have quite a bit of data that you can give to users, both over a wide range and even more in a close proximity. You have uh, higher data rates for office use. You have packet switch and service switch. You have adaptive interfaces to the internet. But what happens, what made it all possible was CDMA. What, what everyone was banking on, what everyone was banking on with 3G was, if we use this cool technology, we have infinite capacity. We just have to spread everyone's signal across a wide band, and I could put hundreds of signals in that same band. What they didn't realize, if you have 100 people on top of each other, frequency-wise, they self-interfere with each other. And what ends up happening is you don't realize that capacity. So you don't get hundreds and hundreds of people. Plus, the implementation of CDMA, actually, what hap the, the actual hardware is quite a bit more complicated. It drove up the cost. It wasn't trivial. And you know what took root? You know what actually took root over 3G? Wi-Fi. So what happened is, when 3G came up, and it didn't meet its expectations, then you had this very simple, unassuming 802.11 standard that became 802.11b. And everybody says, this Wi-Fi thing is the bomb. It gives me all this access to the wireless that I wanted to. Oh, what's this Skype thing, this voice over IP? It was doing the stuff that CDMA and 3G was promising in terms of data. So what happens is when 3G, 3G did not roll out as expected, people turned to Wi-Fi. They were talking about deploying Wi-Fi, multiple access points, across a geographical region to be almost like a pseudo-telephone network. And, so, and then at the same time, people were doing different standards. You had WCDMA, wideband CDMA. You had CDMA 2000. And you had time division single... CDMA, I think, but these were from different countries, different continents, different standards groups. Everyone was fighting. This is what 3G should be. Okay, so I kind of described in the last slide, in, in lecture nine, what CDMA worked, how it worked. But this is the thing that everybody's talking about right now. LTE, or long-term evolution. So what this guy does, first of all, everything is IP-based. Everything, your voice, your streaming video, everything is, pack, is packetized, right? And you have crazy data rates, downlink and uplink. And you have cell sizes ranging from femtocells, which we talked about in lecture nine, all the way to huge macro cells on the order of 62 miles, right? So what happens is you have these tiers of different service regions from very small to huge and also has coexistent capabilities with all previous systems. All right, so to wrap things up, there's Bluetooth. And this is the funny thing I wanted to talk about Bluetooth. Where the heck did Bluetooth come from? Is it like a really cool name? Like, you know, where's the X in it? So I looked on Wikipedia, and I take this with a grain of salt, because again, I don't know why I brought up Wikipedia twice in this lecture. You probably noticed that I didn't have much sleep. What happens is, supposedly, Bluetooth came from Harold Bluetooth Gromsen, which was king of Denmark and Norway. And the reason, one reason they gave 
the name Bluetooth is because he had pretty bad teeth. And there was one tooth that was so rotted that it looked blue in coloration. Yeah, and, and you know, that's what you're putting on your ear and stuff. So with that note, so hopefully you can go around and use that trivia with other people and gross people out. But the cool thing about Bluetooth, it's a great extension. We use it all the time. Not super safe because there are a lot of holes in that standard. But it's nevertheless something for a personal area network within a few feet. And there are a variety of protocols um, that range from radio access, which is short range, all the way to the logical and link layer in the service protocols. So definitely Bluetooth, cellular networks. We saw Wi-Fi a little bit before. This is how we went from like 10, 15 years ago, not being a wireless society, to being a wireless society today. So with that, that concludes lecture 10.